let's if you have your Bibles if you meet me in Acts chapter number 27 Acts chapter number 27 um, if you're visiting with us for the first time and, and you know don't mind letting us know we're an introvert friendly church so if you don't want to bring attention to yourself it's okay we, we you can you can chill uh, but if you don't mind letting us know that you're a visitor if you're a visitor if you would uh, real quick throw your hand in the air and just wave it like you just don't care if you are a visitor just let us know you're in the house God bless you Antioch if you see a hand go show them some love go show the visitors some love real quick show them some love welcome them into the house of the Lord If you have your Bibles, Acts 27. When you get there, say something. If you're not there yet, say hold up. Wait a minute. And when you get there, let me know you are there. Acts 27. Um, and I, and I want to give a, a special acknowledgement to all those who have battled um, as this is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, um, but this day for us, we're celebrating Breast can Cancer Awareness. To all those who have um, struggled with breast cancer, who's lost anybody to breast cancer, to those of you who are currently uh, in that battle, we recognize you, we, we honor you. Uh, we thank God for you. You're not doing this alone, but there are a community of people that are here walking with you every step of the way. Uh, sometimes God delivers us from challenges in our life. Other times, he allows us to go through it. And one of the blessings we have in going through it is that we are able to do it with others uh, who we need, and at some point they'll need us. So I'm grateful for the faith community. People believe in God for the best. Some who just love you. They haven't gone through what you've gone through, but they just love you that much to walk with you through it. And others who are familiar, they're acquainted with your grief. They're acquainted with your struggle, your uncertainty, and your fear. And so there are people around you who know what that journey is, but then there are others who know what it is to come through that on the other side with a testimony. And so we're grateful for all those who, who have struggled with, who um, have been diagnosed, who are currently battling breast cancer, who are in remission, uh, any of those things. If you would just lift your hand, wave at us, let us know. Just let us know. Come on. Antioch, I want you to celebrate. I want you to celebrate these folks around you. We stand with you. And so, if you would, meet me in Acts, the 27th chapter, beginning at the 27th verse. It is a long passage. I'm skipping quite a bit, but I'll try to fill in the blanks the best I can. And it reads, on the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea. When about midnight, the sailors sensed that there was an, they were approaching land, they took soundings and found the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found that it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that they had the lifeboats on and let it drift away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat for the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from your head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat it. They were all encouraged and they ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When 
They had eaten as much as they wanted. They lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could, cutting loose the anchors. They left them in the sea. At the same time, untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship, the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow struck fast and would not move. The stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. Verse number 42. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard to get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or other pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached the land safely. Father, we thank you, we praise you, we glorify you in this place. I pray that you be honored, you be glorified, and speak to us like only you can. A word that will take us from where we are to where you called us to be, that will be enriched, revived, rejuvenated, and find ourselves in the center of your wheel, having been together, and we'll give you glory for it, honor and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, right before you take your seats, uh, I want to give you the topic, but it is also a declaration to about five people around you before you take your seats. Uh, I want uh, you to look at five people squarely in their eyes and tell them, I am a survivor. Tell them I'm a survivor. Survivor. Tell them we made it. We made it. We made it. I'm a survivor. We made it. It's not only a fitting declaration for those who have survived breast cancer, but I think it is a worthwhile declaration for those of us, any of us, who have survived anything. Um, just by a show of hands, we've celebrated those who have survived breast cancer, but is there, out of curiosity, is there anybody by a show of hands, I want to make sure I'm in the right place, who has survived anything? Ah, okay, good, I'm in the right place. This passage that I began with, and I'm not going to labor through it because you were so kind in listening to the tribute videos, I'm not going to make you pay for it with a long message. But this passage is a passage of partnership. I this either sleep over here. This passage is a passage of partnership. Can't you see it in there? It is. And, and go easy on me. I, I, I forgot that this Sunday was Breast Cancer Awareness Sunday. I had another message, but when I realized it at 12 midnight, I called an audible, so, so just, just, just be patient with me. If, if it's not as polished as, as your Manny Petty, just, just be patient with me. As I was driving here, I not only saw a place where there was an allusion to partnership, but I realized that there was a a thread of partnership that is weaved into the fabric of this entire text. It is one of partnerships. Say partnership. partnership. Yeah, partnership. It is, there are all sorts of partnerships. There, there are unique dynamics. But the one I want to draw your attention to is the interplay between human and divine partnership. We speak of God as a deliverer. 
But, but few address the nuance in diversity involved with his deliverance. God does not always deliver us from what we need delivering from in the same way. But, but God, like a, a proficient quarterback, our chess master always has more than one play to accomplish the end goal. And whether it is blessing us, whether it is opening up a door for us, or whether it is delivering us from what we need deliverance from, God does not always do it the same way. Because if God did it the same way, then our faith would atrophy in the areas that need to be developed. So God will never do it the same way every time in your life and in every circumstance. And the more comfortable we become with allowing God to be God and allowing God to deliver like God chooses to deliver, the, the better we are. Because in God delivering us in various ways, God reveals God's multifaceted nature. That is why when Pharaoh asked, or Moses asked when going to Pharaoh, who should I tell him you are? God laughed to himself. <laughs> he said, I can't in this few moments of time that I need you to go from here to Pharaoh give you the information you need by, by confining who I am to your minuscule human mindset. So he said, so what I'm going to do is give you a quick one-liner. You can go to him and tell him that, that I am that I am sent you. The reason after I say I am that I am is because I can't explain who I am with one line. You don't get me through definition, you get me through experience. It is not that I won't reveal myself, it's just that I can't contain all that I am right now. But after I deliver you and the children of Israel walk through the wilderness and journey with me for years to come, they will begin to understand who I am. And there's no way of understanding who I am without getting my multifacetedness. So when I provide for them, in a way that they weren't expecting it but needed it, they will know me as Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. When they are in battle and their back is up against the wall, they can do nothing to change their circumstance, but I show up and deliver them in battle, they will know me as Jehovah Nisi, my victory and my battle. Are you still here with me? Um, and so when I'm with them, they will, you, you, you get the point. He, he says, you will not be able to get me by definition, but you get me through experience. And so in order to get different vantage points of the multifaceted God, he has got to have diversity in the way that he delivers us from the circumstance that he delivers us from. But the other reason that God has diversity and changes his method of deliverance is not simply so that we know him in different ways through different vantage points, but it's also that we are, so that we are developed in all of the areas we need to be developed in. And so I want to just make sure I'm clear about this. Deliverance comes in multifaceted ways. But here in this passage, I want to deal with the deliverance that I see right here. Don't, don't, don't you see it? Just, just give me a little time. I'm going to get you to brunch on time. Just, just, just give me a second. We speak of God as deliverer. But again, few address the nuance and diversity involved with his deliverance. Here in this passage, there is an underrated method of the deliverance of God that is right under our nose. It is miraculous, but it's not the kind of miraculous 
deliverance that we've come to expect when we see God at work. Now, let me just give you a little background and context, and you'll begin to see the thread of partnership running through this text. Here it is. Paul, at this moment, is a prisoner in transport. He has been turned over to a, a centurion, uh, really a, a military soldier, but one who, in many respects, serves as a, a police officer of sorts, to guard him and to deliver him where he will stand trial. But in order to get there, they, they didn't have helicopters. They had to transport the man by boat. He was, uh, uh, it's right there. You missed it, but it's right there. They had to transport him by boat. There's a blues clue in the fact that they transported him by boat. There is a unique foreshadowing for the sort of partnership that is contained in this text. They didn't transport him on foot, but it's interesting that they use a boat. They transported him by boat. Say boat. The kind of boat this was, it was in what's called, if you take notes, an Alexandrian grain freighter. So, so it was one of, for many years, the largest vessels that they would have. They would use it from port to port to transport goods, primarily to transport grain. But when they were looking to hitch a ride from one port to another, sometimes they would jump on. And so this, this, this centurion, along with some soldiers, along with other prisoners and Paul, are placed on this vessel, the and Alexandrian grain freight. It was, it was a massive boat, now notice this, that was propelled through the water in many ways, but the primary way foreshadows the partnership that we see in this text. It was not a rowboat. Obviously, it was first century. It was not um, a motorboat, but it was an Alexandrian grain boat, and the composition of the boat gives us a snapshot into a unique partnership because it was not all human effort on this boat. There were oars and sometimes even rows. Just in case there was no wind, they could still move a bit. But it also had sails on it, giant sails on it, so that, that the boat would catch like a sailboat the wind and be propelled forward by the boat. Now notice this. This is, it speaks of two things. It speaks of human effort with the oars and the rose, we're gonna come back to that in a minute, cat. But it also was propelled by the wind, that which they had no control over. It was what was breathed into the boat to make sure that the boat moved. Now, some of you are AP Bible students. The rest of y'all were in, you're in remedial classes like I was, it's cool, but you'll get it in a minute. But, but there is a unique con comparison to this boat and to the life of the believer. Because quite honestly, here's the idea. The, the believer is not a cruise ship. The believer is not a motorboat. Here we go back with boat. The believer is kind of like this. In the life of the believer, the journey of the believer is kind of like this Alexandrian grain freighter. There is this unique partnership, this synthesis, this tethered relationship between God and us. Try this side, they sleep over here. If you've lived long enough, you realize sometimes, particularly when you're in immaturity and you're learning about God, God will just do all sorts of miraculous things. When you're in maturity with God, God still does a lot of miraculous things. But sometimes the nature of the miraculous things that God does when you're in maturity and have been walking with him for a while is much more subtle and less prominent than the way that God did it when you were a person that needed to believe up front because you did not have belief. Both are miracles, but God over time will emphasize the way God does miracles in your life depending on where you are, 
what he wants to show you of himself and what needs developing in you. So at the beginning, when deliverance is fresh, like the children of Israel who come out of the wilderness, God gave them supernatural bread from heaven. All they had to do is wake up in the morning and new bread fell into their lap. They had the chance, the rapper anointing when they first started. Um, every time they woke up, blessing just kept falling in their lap. Are you with me? That's how it was. All they had to do was get up in the morning and God sent food again for the next day. The only request is you don't keep that food because I'm going to do another dramatic miracle the next day. Get rid of that and the next day believe that I'm going to send fresh bread from heaven. You're not going to have to work for it. You're not going to have to do anything. You don't have to earn it. But in this early stage, I'm just showing you that I'm God all by myself. And I'm going to give you miracles that you do nothing about. But notice, after walking with him, them, him in the wilderness for 40 years, they get to the promised land. The Bible declares the moment they get to the promised land, the manna stops. Let me see if I can work this. It did not say that the miracle stopped. But it said the manna stopped. They were still experiencing miracles, but the miracles this time were that they were going to have to take seed, put seed in the ground, and work a little bit. But once they got the seed in the ground, God would cause what they had in the ground to be blessed. Are you still here with me? In immaturity, God just causes blessings to fall in your lap and you don't have to do a doggone thing because he's just showing you that he's God. But when you get good and mature, God says, I don't want you simply to receive blessings from me as your faith muscles atrophy. He said, but I want you to join me in what I am doing, align with me and your activity will be required, but I will put my blessing on your activity. When you're in immaturity, God does it all. But when you're in maturity, God says it's time for you, like the kids living, you can still live under my roof, are you with me? But you have to do some chores. I took care of you while you were a baby and you did nothing. But in maturity, you still have the roof over your head. I'm still your father. Nobody's going to run up in this house and deal with you without having to go through me. I still am holding it down, but I want you in maturity to partner with me to accomplish what happens in this house. And for many, God hasn't done it today like he did it when you started and you think God is not with you. Listen, you got to upgrade and don't even know it. God said in maturity, you can partner with me in the same way you were excited when you got a key to the house, when you were responsible enough to deal with it. God says this is not to take work from me, but it is rather it is to cause you to come up into maturity to partner with me and what I'm doing. That is not a downgrade. It is an upgrade. Another way that God blesses us, still a miracle, is not when he just calls his blessings to fall in our lap. But when he works in tandem with us, with human ability and divine enablement. What does that have to do with the ship? The ship was both a composition of physical sailors, activity, wisdom, and rowing while simultaneously working with the sails, the winds that blew the ship to propel it forward. The composition of our life is always a combination of our human efforts and the wind of God's spirit. Ooh, they're going to make me work today. I thought that was good when I studied it, but I it just, it is, it is a ship. God, I feel this, that they're on. They're on a ship going from one place to another. And I want you to see this partnership in between the two. So they're traveling on this vessel, and this vessel is foreshadowing this relationship that I shared with you, a relationship between God at work, but also humans at work to accomplish what God desires to be accomplished. Now, I want to talk to some mature believers 
today. Paul stands trial as he's fasting en route to the place that he'll stand trial. But as he's doing that, there is a heightened sense of spirituality. The Spirit of the Lord is beginning to speak to Paul. And the Bible says that there is an angel of the Lord that comes and gives Paul insight into what's going to happen on this trip. He gets a revelation. And as he gets his revelation of what's going to happen, it produces a conflict on the boat. There will always be conflict between <sighs> divine revelation and empirical observation. Sometimes there is a continuity, but when God speaks to you, sometimes what God speaks to you, another message, will fly in the face of the observation of those that are around you. So Paul says, I have a vision that if we don't get off this water, y'all, this boat is going to crash. The boat will be lost and many people on board will be lost. Thus saith the Lord. They look at him. The centurion says, now this is what Paul says. The sailor says, thus saith the sailor. We're going to stay on this water. And Paul's like, listen, don't think it's a good idea. I feel like the Lord told me that, that, that we need to stop. But, but if y'all want to go ahead, it's on you. I've been fasting. I'm really in the spirit, y'all. Uh, trust me. Uh, the sailor says, I, I understand you're in the spirit, but, but you are not a sailor. So the centurion makes the final decision and says, well, let's keep sailing. So there's a conflict on board. Paul gives prophetic vision that there would be a loss of life and the ship would be lost. But they decide to go forward and proceed anyway. They, they ignore the divine prompting. Paul says, all right, y'all then fasten your seatbelts. The Bible declares the wind starts to stir. And the storm ensues. It gets so bad, y'all, <laughs> that the sailors start second-guessing it. Like, oh, man, and they're talking to each other. Man, you should have listened to him. I heard he's a real prophet. I know there's a whole lot of people out here just trying to get your money. They're false prophets. But this is a real one. The, skull, the Bible says the sky got darkened. They were in the dark. The boat was literally being tossed in this storm. There was significant darkness for a period of time. Everybody's losing it. And as everybody's losing it, uh, Paul gets another word. And here's the second word. I love that God is progressive in his speaking. That's why you can't just hear what God said 10 years ago and just try to stand on that and move forward because the nature of God speaking is never to give you a word to walk away from him, to stand on that word. The nature of God speaking is to draw greater intimacy with him so he'll give you a word to give you the general direction, but you have to stay with him to get the specifics. Because the word is not simply meant for your advancement. The word is meant for you to develop intimacy with the living God. Are you still here with me? So don't just stand on the word that you got a while back. Make sure that you're checking in with the source so that that word continues to become progressive because the nature of God is to draw you toward the source, not just to bring elevation in your life. But if you're drawn toward the source, you experience the elevation and the blessing that he has. So Paul checks back in for another word from God. I don't know if he was praying, saying, Lord, these people are not obeying and I don't want to die right now. I have some work I need to do. He begins to see God. And gets another word. At this point in time, everybody's panicking. There is uncertainty. But Paul gets another word that everyone is going to survive this storm. God, I feel this. And they're going to live to tell about it. I love how it got real dire and, and dark. And those that were on the boat who were obedient to the Lord, know when Paul says something, knew when Paul said something, he didn't miss. So they were nervous going into this storm saying, Paul just said, if we don't get up out of here, this boat is going to be lost and we're going to lose our lives. But the sailors decided to go into the storm anyway. Now it's dark all around them. The ship is being tossed. They're throwing things overboard. The sailors are beginning to panic, and I'm sure they were looking to Paul like, is this where we die? 
Paul said, don't even trip, y'all. The word Lord gave me another word. And here is the new word. New word is, we're all going to live. The boat ain't going to make it, y'all. But we're all going to live. In fact, let me take it a little further. He said, not one hair on your head is going to be lost. But you're going to get through this storm. God, I feel this. And you're going to live to tell about it. This ride is going to be rough, but you're going to get through this storm and you're going to live to tell about it. We're all going to be holding on to each other because it's, it's going to get worse before it gets better. But the Lord told me that we're going to get through this storm and we're going to live to tell about it. I know the first word you got, the diagnosis was that we weren't going to make it. But I got another word from the Lord. We are going to get through this storm and we're going to live to tell. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I feel prophetically. And there should be enough testimonies in the house. I ain't ready yet. I ain't ready yet. There should be enough testimonies in the house to testify to someone who is currently in a struggle I need some people that have been through the struggle. It got darker. It didn't look like you're going to make it. The storm was raging. You couldn't see your way. You had to cry some tears. It got worse before it got better. But you look back and after all these years, you got through it. God took you through many dangers, toils and snares. You're on the other side of it and you live to tell. I need someone who's been through the struggle to testify to someone in the struggle. I don't care how this boat is shaking. I don't know if this boat's going to fall apart, but I prophesy to you that you're going to get through the storm and you're going to live. Tell the story. Touch three people around you. Tell them you're going to get through this. 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 Don't get, you're going to get through this. You're going to tell about it. What does that mean? You're going to get through this with another testimony of God's goodness. You're going to get through this with another miracle. I know what God did for you back in 1997, but that miracle is all. Ash, behold, I will do a new thing. Look at somebody. Tell them the only reason for this trial is so that God can give you a fresh testimony of his goodness. Tell them one more time. You're going to get through this, and you're going to live to tell them. You're going to live to tell about it. He, he said, all right, now listen, y'all. I know it's a tough word. He said, but you're going to get through this and you're going to live to tell about it. Now, it's interesting because word, words are interesting. There's a combination, follow me, this is what gets me, um, of a supernatural insight um, and very practical insight. Again, there is a thread that runs through here of partnership. It is this interplay between the divine and the human that runs through this text. It is foreshadowed by a boat, this ship that has sails that's pushed by the wind that is what's out of our control. But then navigating crafty salesmen who have oars that is in our control. To paint the picture that this life is a combination of what God does and what we do in partnership with God. Sometimes God does it for us, but other times God does it through us. Then there are times where God, follow me, does it with us. Right, one more time, one of some things bear repeating. There are some times that God does it for us. There are some times that God does it, and then there are other times that God does it I submit to you that this passage in its entirety is one that is comprised of divine partnership where God does it with them. Are you still here with me? With panic and uncertainty, Paul gets another word that they will survive this storm and live to tell about it. Now, here's what's interesting. The words are an interesting combination of supernatural insight and natural provision. What do I mean? Prophetically, he says, you will be spared 
from the coming storm, not one single hair on your head will be affected. But if you remember in the passage, he says something else. He says, y'all haven't eaten for 14 days because you've been panicking. He says, but I want to give you your appetite back. You've been so consumed with this storm and the word of doom that you thought was coming that y'all can't even eat. You're messed up. So he says, uh, before God does the miracle, I'm going to give you a word of what God, God's going to do. He says, I'm going to give you a word that you're going to make it. Now eat something. All right, I know y'all slow like I used to be. He says, God has supernaturally given me a word by angelic visitation. God, the same God that physically appeared to me on the Damascus road and leveled me, blinded me, and then sent Ananias to lay hands on me supernaturally that I may receive my sight. The supernatural God that has done miracles, the supernatural God that healed Paul from venomous snake bites, the supernatural God that gave Paul revelations that no one else had had to that point. He said, our God, in fact, is a supernatural God. And he has given me supernatural revelation that we're going to make it. That's the divine part. <laughs> the wind and the sails. But he says, here's what I need you to do. I need you to eat something. Because their worry had so consumed them, they weren't able to eat. But God gave them a prophetic message that everything was going to be all right. And with the word that everything was going to be all right, even before it was all right, they got their appetite back. Look at your neighbor tell them, you're going to eat something after today. We, we, we're going. But, but the greater revelation is this. Is that God supernaturally gives them revelation through someone who is familiar with the prominent supernatural hand of God. But what strikes me about this passage is, while Paul was used to the prominent supernatural hand of God, the prominent supernatural God gives him a very practical instruction to give the people. He says... God's going to deliver, number one, I got that from the wind of the Spirit supernaturally. But I need you to pick up your oars and do something practically. He says, notice this, and I'm quoting specifically. He says, now I urge you to take some food. You'll need it to survive. All right, y'all going to work me today. Where are my AP students? He says, there is a supernatural wind of God. But the practical thing I need you to do to ensure you get to victory and that you survive is that you put some food in your stomach. I'm talking to all my real holy rollers that are waiting for God to do everything because God spoke it. I'm just waiting for it to happen. I'm waiting for it to manifest. You better stand your manifesting self up, grab an oar, let God do what he can do. <laughs> Breathe the wind that will push you along, but you do what you... Because this deliverance is not coming from heaven. This deliverance is coming through partnership. He said, I got divine revelation. And the divine revelation is telling me you need to eat something. Put something on your stomach. The divine revelation is saying you need to fill out the job application. The divine revelation is saying you need to go pass out your cards. The divine revelation says you're going to be a multi-millionaire, but you need to go back to school. The divine revelation says, I know God speaks to you, but you need a mentor. The divine revelation says, I know that God is a healer, but do the chemo until he heals. The it's a, touch somebody, tell them it's a partnership. It's a it's a partnership. It's God, I feel like preaching. It's a 
partnership. God, God's hand being seen through the interplay between the divine and the natural provision. He blesses. God, I feel this. Paul takes the bread and he blesses the bread. He blesses, follow me, the natural provision. God gives supernatural revelation, but oftentimes he'll take natural things and put them in the hands of people with supernatural faith. Work both of them together in the composition to cause you to come out on the other side. Touch somebody, tell them God is not doing this by himself, nor will he leave you to do it by himself, but this one will be a partnership this one will be healing but also some wellness this one will be miracles but also some blessed natural sciences in the hands of people with faith this one will be some prayer but also some follow up with your doctor notice how Paul's divine revelation and prophetic insight number two is orchestrating the natural process and practical affairs we gotta go give me five more minutes and I'm done so here's what happens even after the word, things get worse. Has anybody? Ever had a word from God that gave hope, but before it got better, just me, it got worse. He prophesied that your husband's on the way. And you met five smooth plans before, no, just before he got there, he prophesied that there is financial blessing on the way, but you got four flat tires and only had money to fix one. Has, has it ever gotten worse before it got better? So Paul says, it's going to be all right. Eat some bread. It's cool. Fill up your stomach, I hear the Lord saying, fill up your stomach because what's ahead will require not only his supernatural provision, but your natural strength. So the blessing is your obedience to his supernatural to do the natural things that will pull out his end results. Look at your neighbor, tell him we need both of them, both of them. Because this is a passage of divine partnership. So before it gets better, it gets worse. The ship starts to shake. The storm ensues. It gets so bad that the sailors plan to abandon the ship and not tell anybody. So they wait until everybody's chill. They say, we'll be right back. We're going to go lower the anchors. But the Bible says they didn't go to lower the anchors. They went to go lower the lifeboats. So that they could escape in safety while everyone else dies. But they had someone who was supernaturally wired on the boat. Paul picked it up in the spirit. And he starts from spiritual things starting to orchestrate natural things. He said, God is a miracle worker, but if these sailors leave the boat, we are all going to die. That's deep. He said, God is the same one that could quiet this storm. But this time, see, some of us have divine arrogance. Huh? This time, God is not going to bring the deliverance by quieting the storm. God is going to bring the deliverance through obedient steps and you've got to learn to discern the difference sometimes God gives you your miracle through quieting the storm other times God gives you your miracle through you listening and following through obedient steps he does not have a prayer meeting on board and say let, let's pray y'all that the storm stops he says don't let those sailors leave 
because if those natural sailors leave we're not going to get the supernatural miracle of deliverance because God is moving but he ain't moving like that in this circumstance because he's multifaceted he wants you to see different sides of him and he wants you to develop different competencies so this time he will not say peace be still to the storm he will say obey my will to the believer I feel like preacher give somebody a high five tell him sometimes he heals the cancer other times he orders my steps lets me lose my hair but brings me back through on the testify to somebody tell them I'm walking in obedience I'm I'm walking in obedience get those sailors back on the boat we need God and we need those doctors we need God and we need those lawyers we need God and we need those scientists get them back on the tell somebody it's practical but you've got to learn to praise God for the practical miracles I know he healed you supernaturally but touch yourself tell him he healed me practically I, I know he kept you out of jail but he sent me to jail it wasn't meant for you to go but it was meant for me to have that testimony but howsoever God wants to bless me I don't care how he blesses me I just care that he blesses me is there anybody who say I don't care how he blesses me Lord I'll take whatever blessing thank you that you dried my tears but thank you for every tear I had to cry I learned something through the tears tell somebody it's a it's a partnership let me go let me go we gotta go uh we gotta go but it's a partnership grab somebody by the hand and tell them it's a partnership i i can't do this alone i need you i'm believing god but i still need your prayers i i'm believing god but i still needed your call when my back was up against the wall i, I believe god but i thank god for everybody who came to visit me in the hospital I, I need God, but I thank God for everybody who put their hands around me. I need the Lord, but thank God that I needed you to grab somebody by the hand. So get back on this ship. I'm not going to make it with you without you. You're not going to make it without me. The only way that we're going to get to our destination is to together grab somebody by the hand. So I need you. 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 Yeah, we gotta go. But he said it got so bad, the ship was shaking, but he was holding on to the word that everything was gonna be all right. Grab somebody by the hand. So I don't know how, I don't know when God's gonna do it, but I got a word that everything. That everything is going to be everything, everything is going to be all right grab by the hand so the ship was shaking they thought they were going to die the centurion said Paul are we going to make it Paul said yeah we're going to make it I got a word but the ship is falling apart the ship is in pieces he said don't trip he said everybody who can swim jump off God just said you were gonna get there he didn't say how you were gonna get there he didn't say you were, you were gonna get there on the ship he just said that you were gonna get there grab somebody tell me, I don't know how I'm gonna get there I may not go out like I came in I may be beat up after I come out of this but if I'm beat up I'm just glad I made it got tears in my eye, but I'm glad I made it bruises on my side but I'm glad I made it I'm still spitting up water but I'm glad oh, 
I'm glad I made it. Tell somebody I'm glad I made it. I'm glad I made it. Came through. Yeah. Lost my hair, yes, but I'm glad yes, I made it. I made it. I'm not as voluptuous yes, as when I went in, but I'm just glad. I made, it. I made it. He said, if you can jump off and swim, jump off. Because God's word is that you're going to get there, but you're going to have to swim. For life, the miracle is not from heaven by itself, but the miracle is after you're tired and worn. God says, I know you feel like giving up, but my word is that you'll get there. The miracle is not that I'll take you up or cause the storm to stop, but the miracle is, even though you're tired, I'm going to let you get to the other side. But then there are others who are on the boat who look he said, we can't swim. So I don't know what's going to happen to us. He said, I got a word that you're going to get there. He said, I know you can't do what they do. But he said, this ship's in pieces. And if you can just grab. One of the broken pieces. I know you don't have it in you. But if you could just grab one of the broken pieces and hold on to it, he said, you'll make it to the shore. And I came to talk to some people who said, I don't have any more energy to fight. I don't have any more strength to believe. I don't have anything left. God says, but can you at least hold on? I know you've lost your strength. But all I need you to do is hold on. Is there anybody who knows that if you could just hold on, God will get you to the finish line. Grab somebody by the hand and tell them even if you can't swim, tell them just hold on, hold on, hold on. Just a little bit longer. I know the waves are blowing. I know the winds are raging. But if you can hold. I called some of you at the lowest times in your life. And I was looking for where you were. And for some of you, your response, the best you had was, Pastor, I'm holding on. Oh, hold. But I need some witnesses who know what God will do uh, if you could just. Oh, uh, yeah. As I look back over these 20 years, Terry, I couldn't always, I Joanne, I couldn't always swim. Uh, I wasn't the smartest, I wasn't the brightest, I, I wasn't the most polished, I didn't have the largest church in America, but, but one thing nobody was going to beat me in is... Holding. You won't believe what God will do for those uh, who can just hold on. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mother, I know what you're going through. Yeah, yeah. I don't know which of us going to go first. If I go first, I want you at my service. If you go first, I hope you let me preach your service. Because what I'm going to tell everybody is you are an amazing singer and a faithful member. 
defender of your family and a lover of ministry in the Lord. But when I look at you and some of the others in this place, the number one characteristic is I've watched you hold on. I, yeah, yeah. I, I've watched you hold on. I, I've watched you hold on through ups and I watched you hold on through downs. I, Watch you hold on to financial challenges. I've watched you hold on praying over your kids. And I've watched you hold on one trial after another. I watched you hold on through a stroke. Is there is there anybody who can? I watched you hold on. Uh, when your haters and your critics thought it was over <laughs> and didn't realize that God had a play up his sleeve that would exceed everything that they ever imagined. Not with a ship that's intact, but with broken pieces. Ah, you got to where it is God called you to go. It's on broken pieces. They get to the other side. They all get there to the shore. They they start counting it. Everybody's here. We survived. I need you to testify to somebody next to you like you mean it grab one person by both hands look them in the eye tell them we survive tell them we yeah we survive we survive we survive yeah yeah we survive we survive i'm done with this and we'll explain it later. But here's what I love about God. The God that allows you to participate in the struggle or the work of deliverance is also the God that allows you to participate in the glory of deliverance. I know we say, oh no, it's God. It was only God. It was only God. It was only God. It was only God. That, that, that is when God, when God wants you to come to the end of the battle and say it was only God is when he tells you to be still and let me fight your battles. But when God allows you to participate in the deliverance, he does not only want you to say it was only God. In the Garden of Eden, he told Adam, I want you to co-labor with me. He tells Joshua, when he crosses into the promised land, if you do it this way, I will receive the glory, but I'm going to make your name great too. He tells us, if we suffer with him, we will reign with him. So God allows us sometimes to participate in maturity in the work of the victory not only because we're mature but whenever God allows us to participate in the work it's because he wants us to celebrate too in the glory we glorify and praise him as God because we know we couldn't have done it without him but God does it this way so that we know that he wouldn't have done it without us. So that when we get to the end of our journey and when we make it to the peaceful shore, we can look at God and we can say, Lord, we did that thing, didn't we? I came to tell you, it's okay to give glory to God, but for all to also say, we survived. We fought the good fight. We kept the faith. Look at your neighbor. Tell him, we did it to God be the glory. Tell them we survive.